A few weeks ago, we heard the part of Mark's Gospel, a chapter earlier than the one we heard this morning, in which Jesus asks his disciples, Who do you say that I am? The question of identity as Jesus followers, that is, who is Jesus and who are we as ones who are called to follow the one called Christ? They continue through this morning's reading from the Gospel of Mark. Last week, Jesus addressed who the greatest among them was and who they were called to be as ones who welcome God by welcoming the least among them. This week, the disciples' identity crisis continues. They want to stop a group of people from healing in Jesus' name because the ones doing the healing weren't part of their group. At this point in Mark's Gospel, it's really hard to imagine that the disciples couldn't figure out what Jesus' response was going to be, given the last two or three exchanges they've had with him. But they complained to him anyway. And Jesus responds quite predictably. Basically, he says, look, they're doing the work aren't they? That's what matters. What's your problem? The reason we get so many questions of identity in Mark's Gospel is because the community to which Mark was writing, they were having identity struggles of their own. These new, small groups of Jesus followers were trying to figure out what it meant to call yourself a part of that group. And as differences between these new, small groups began to appear, the very human instinct to try to discern which group was right began to emerge as well. So Mark using Jesus' teaching on the subject, tells the early church, stop figuring out who's better. Just do the work. Jesus continues with his warning that his followers ought not to be stumbling blocks for anyone desiring a relationship with him. It would be better for someone who gets in the way of another's relationship with God, to have a millstone tied around their neck and to be tossed into the sea. Not one of Jesus' more subtle images. Jesus' harsh warning caused me to ask myself, how might I be a stumbling block to anyone who longs for a relationship with God? How might I be getting in the way? Of course, as a leader in the institutional church, I know that the church itself has been a stumbling block. Whenever the church has erred on the side of power or greed or fear, the church has caused many to stumble. And in many places, I know it still does, and it needs to repent. It is a human institution, and as long as it is run by humans on this earth who seek after power or greed or who use fear as their guide, it will continue to fall short of being the church God calls us to be. But that's out there, somebody else's fault. I wonder about how I, as an individual, can be tempted by those same things. How does fear or greed or a longing for power find a home in my heart? And how does it all find its way out into my words and my deeds? 
What stumbling blocks have I thrown on the path of another on their way toward God? It can be easy, and it is quite tempting, as a more progressive congregation in a more progressive denomination in a more progressive part of the country to assume we here gathered are without stumbling blocks. Let's remember, though, shall we, that women have only been ordained in this church for 45 years. They have only been bishops in this church for just over 30. Women clergy in this church earn less than their male counterparts in the same roles, and they hold fewer leadership positions at the parish and diocesan levels. Let us remember, shall we, that though Jean Robinson was elected the first openly gay bishop in 2003, today there are only three openly gay diocesan bishops in the Episcopal Church out of over 110. And let us remember, shall we, that we are only just beginning to uncover and tell the truth of our church's historic and current role in the oppression of our siblings in Christ, who are black, who are indigenous, who are Asian, who are Latino, and not to put too fine a point on it, but when my portrait joins those of the previous 13 rectors of St. Paul's Brookline lining the hallway, mine will be the 13th picture of a white male. So yes, there is plenty of work to be done in the church. And yes, there are many stumbling blocks we as a parish as a diocese, as a denomination, are actively working to dismantle. And much of this work involves teaching people who God is not. God does not hate gay people. God is not inherently male. God is not white. God is not... We are well versed here in the God is not conversation, helping us to unlearn old stumbling blocks we inherited. But I do wonder if I have been as clear with those who might be seeking a relationship with God about who or what God is as much as who or what God is not. Other stumbling blocks I create that are, we might call, stumbling blocks of omission. This week a, I saw a post on Facebook that referenced studies that reportedly say that the number of young people who profess to believe in God is the lowest they have ever been. Now, Rest assured, I do not usually engage with these kind of click-baiting posts that don't cite the research they are supposedly referencing or clarify their terms. I mean, after all, what do you even mean by believe in God? What were the terms used? Maybe I don't believe in that concept or image of God either. But then I saw a comment from a friend of mine from college suggesting that she thought young people don't believe in God anymore because they've come to realize the church is just a force of oppression and they don't need to believe in all that nonsense. Okay. Ouch. <laughs> now, I know better than to try to engage in these kinds of conversations on social media. I get to write sermons instead. <laughs> Reflecting on that post and my friend's response, I wondered if young people say they don't believe in God because they are only clear about who God isn't. And maybe they're not so sure who God is. Are they clear on what Christianity shouldn't be, but 
a bit fuzzy on what being part of a community who follows Jesus can be, ought to be. Are we as clear about who we are as a church and what we stand for as much as we are who we are not and what we reject? Who are we? Who do we say that we are? I can hear Jesus say in response to my prayer, just do the work. That's what James is saying in his letter to his community. Do the work. If you are suffering, pray. If you are cheerful, sing songs of praise. If you are sick, call on your community. Confess our sins, not in the privacy of some hidden away confessional booth, but to one another. And in so doing, remove isolation and shame and build trust and grow in mutual love for one another. We should pray for one another. Whatever prayer looks like for you, pray for me and I will pray for you. This is who we are. This is who we ought to be. This is who we can be as followers of Jesus Christ. What do you need in order to finish the sentence for yourself? God is. Jesus is. The church is. Remember, Jesus doesn't love us for who we are not, but for who we are. Let us do the work and return God the favor. Amen.